awkward silence. But the message is good. What are you clinging to? What are you holding on to? What do you find of value? What do you think you can't live without? Because there are some people who think they can't live without their car. They can't live without their chocolate. They can't live without something. And the fact of the matter, yes, coffee. In my wife's situation. We love to cling to things that don't last. We love to cling to things that we think are really important that aren't really that important. And this morning, I want to encourage you to do one thing, and that is to cling to Jesus. Cling to him like you've never clinged to him before. I'm excited about this Lenten journey that we've been on over the last few weeks. Can I tell you something? God's never in a hurry. God's never in a hurry. He is so patient with us. He is so patient to allow us to get caught up to where we need to be in life. And he walks with us one step at a time. Now, I don't know where you are on your journey with Jesus. Maybe you're just beginning. Maybe some of this is just new to you. It's like, I'm just beginning this relationship with Jesus. And we've just only have gone a few steps. So I'm not sure where it's going or what it's going to look like. Some of us have walked with him for years. And have gotten closer to him than we've ever gotten to him before. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Jesus, but I want to encourage you, don't ever give up on him. Don't ever give up on that relationship. And don't start clinging to things that aren't of value. When you have Jesus next to you, everything else pales in comparison. Coming to Jesus is just the beginning of our walk in faith. It's only the beginning, the day of our salvation. It's the starting line. It's not the finish line. As we talk about letting go this Lenten season, we all know there are things we should be letting go of and things we should be taking hold of. And this is a time of reevaluating ourselves, looking inward and saying, God, what needs to be changed in my life? What do you want to see happen in my life? I love what Pastor Bruce said this morning. Put your hand over your heart and tell God that you're wanting this heart to change. For me, it was a whole different experience when I put my head on my heart this morning. I said, God, thank you that my heart's still beating. Thank you, Lord, that it's getting stronger every day. Julie and I graduated on Wednesday. So we got to graduate together. I think they were just sick of both of us. I said, you two don't need to come back. No, that's not true. But you know what? That's just the beginning of our exercise routine. Just because we walked out of cardiac rehab on Wednesday doesn't mean that we still have, we don't have work to do. We still have work to do. We have to now create a lifestyle of walking and eating properly and living correctly. That's kind of how it is when we start a relationship with Jesus. Things transform slowly, but they transform. And slowly we begin to see ourselves differently and living differently and being different than we've ever been before. So as you embark on this journey of walking with Jesus, I tell you what, even if it's 30, 40, 50 years, it's so awesome because God's not the same. He changes. Do you believe that? No, he doesn't. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, amen? Amen. Means when you walk with him, you're not going to get a different God on Monday than you got on Tuesday. You're not going to get a different answer on Wednesday that you got on Friday. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he wants us to walk with him. And it's the one steadfast thing I have in my life. Everything else may change. My health may change. My address may change. But God never changes. And one of the reasons why I want to cling to him is because he's my security. He's the one thing I know that will never change. And I would encourage you this morning to begin to think about how it is and what it looks like to cling to him. We're going to look at a story today about the Pharisees. We love to pick on the Pharisees, but they have, they have it coming to them. The Pharisees, we're going to look at a story about how they were blind. How they were blind to the truth. How they were so well versed in scripture and so blind to who Jesus was. They were so connected to the law that they were disconnected from the giver of the law. They were so connected to the rules and the regulations 
that they were disconnected from the one who they claimed they were serving. Church, we can be that way. We can get so caught up in the stuff and the serving and the ministry that we lose out on a personal relationship with Jesus because it's all about the stuff. And I want to talk to you today about clinging to Jesus. We're going to turn to John 9, chapter 9 this morning, starting with verse 41. It's kind of a long, we're going to look at a long verses here this morning, but uh, let me tell you that the end result is not as long, right? The, the, the proclamation of what we're reading this morning, but let's pray over the word today, can't shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. I pray that as we walk through this sermon this morning, that we value knowing more about, that we value knowing you, but also walking with you. I pray, Lord, this morning that this word today would enlighten us, it would encourage us, it would open up our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to be transformed by it. If we find ourselves in this story, I pray, the Lord, that you would begin to speak to us, challenge us, call us out, and then change us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? John 9, starting with verse 1. As he went along, we're talking about Jesus, as Jesus went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is this day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. But while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means to be sent. So the man went, and he washed, and he came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Well, how then were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Well, where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. Well, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, on the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes were a Sabbath. Therefore, the, Ser the, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I was washed, and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. For he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, well, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received sight until they sent him for the, or they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? Well, they said, we know he is our son. The parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. You need to ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Now, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah will be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents, as he is of age, asked him. So a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know that this man is a sinner. Well, he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? 
How did he open your eyes? And he says, I have already told you and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples too? Well, that didn't make him mad. That made him mad. So they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as far as this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. I love the man's answer. Now, that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly who do his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could, not, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Well, Jesus, hearing that they had thrown him out, when he found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus says, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he began to worship him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see your guilt remains. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord. This blind man, blind from birth, decides to get up and do what he normally does every day, goes to the temple, goes wherever he goes and sits and beg for money, beg for food. He had no idea what was going to happen on this day. To him, it was just going to be another day. Can I tell you that those of you who come to church thinking that it's just going to be church, you are missing it. God wants to do something big in your life today. He wants to change you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to modify you. He wants to make you look more like his son, Jesus. He wants to show up in a powerful, miraculous way. And he wants to do that. And you can have a day like no other day. And this man probably woke up that morning assuming the greatest thing would happen to him was he was going to receive a little bit of money, maybe some food. He had no idea that he was going to receive something much better that day. And that day, that man started on his own journey of discovery. We can see a progression of faith in just this short time of this story. We see a great profession of progression of his understanding of who Jesus is. The first time they asked him, who healed you? He said, well, that man they called Jesus. Well, then later on in verse 17, it says, when they brought him in front of the Pharisees, his understanding changed. He went to, he was a man they called Jesus, said, well, he's a prophet. And then later on in verse 33, pressed again by the Pharisees, the man began to understand that surely Jesus was from God. He says he has to be from God to do what he's done. We see the progression finally in verse 35 and 38. He sees Jesus as the Son of God, and he begins to worship him. Wow. That was a quick progression of faith, wasn't it? Getting to know, well, this is just that guy they call Jesus. No, he's a prophet. All of a sudden, they realized that he was from God and that he literally was the Son of God. All of us in life seem to go through that same progression we hear about Jesus and we think, well, yeah, I don't really know much about him. I know his name is Jesus. And then as we walk with him, as he begins to get more in tune and involved in our life, like this man's life, we begin to see the progression of faith and understanding, oh, he's more than just a man with a name. He's more than just a prophet. He has been sent from God, and he is the Son of God. And I can tell you that that moment of time transformed this man's faith in Jesus Christ. You and I need our faith transformed into understanding who Jesus is. Because all of us progress differently in our relationship with him. 
But I think there are two really important themes that were in the story. The first one is we need to hold tightly to Jesus and loosely to doctrine. Now I'll explain that a little bit more because doctrine is important. But the doctors, the, the doctrine the Pharisees believed is that if you sinned, God punished you. So the question was asked, well, who sinned? This man was born, born blind. Who sinned? Sickness and disease like blindness or leprosy were understood to be consequences of someone's sin. And if it wasn't your sin, it was somebody's close to you sin. But you were the recipient of God's wrath because of sin. That's why even the disciples asked Jesus, because it was the disciples who said, Who sinned, this man or his parents, since he was born blind? Even the disciples believed in this doctrine. Jesus made it very clear. He says, neither this man nor his parents sin. But that did not stop the Pharisees from clinging to this doctrine. You and I need to be people who hold on tightly to Jesus and loosely to doctrine. There were things I believed when I was younger that I don't believe anymore because I've clung tightly to Jesus and not so much the doctrine. I wish if I had a, a pair of magic scissors... I would cut from you all the things you were taught as children, all the things you were brought up to believe that do not connect properly with the doctrines of, of, of the scriptures of Jesus Christ. There were things I believed that I had to do. There was rules and regulations that I felt I had to follow. And if I followed them, God would be pleased with me. But see, I was clinging to the doctrine. I was clinging to the belief. I was clinging to the rules. I was clinging to the regulations, but I wasn't clinging to Jesus. Although I thought I was doing all those things for him, I wasn't even having a relationship with him. And here are the Pharisees talking about their doctrine and how wonderful their doctrine is. Here was a man who was born blind, who was given sight. That should be a time of celebration. I can't imagine what would happen in this church if we prayed and somebody walked out of their wheelchair and walked out. If a man born blind was healed and walked. I don't think us, we would just say, oh, that's not right. That's not right. Hey, it's Sunday, Pastor. Are we supposed to do that stuff on Sunday? Pharisees were all worked up. It's, it's a Sabbath day. Come on, God won't do anything on a Sabbath day. God can do anything any day of the week he wants to. But according to their doctrine, it wasn't feasible. According to their doctrine, they shouldn't believe it. So instead of clinging to the one they profess to believe, they only cling to what they knew. Can I tell you something? You can have a great relationship with this book and have no relationship with the author of the book. You can know all there is to know about God, but unless you, unless you walk with him... You just have wisdom and knowledge. There are a lot of people who call the church and they spout all kinds of Christian lingo and then ask for something. They don't have a relationship with God. They just know the right words to say. Pharisees knew. Pharisees knew the scriptures. They knew it better than anybody else. But they lost perspective on who it was they were standing before. You see, they were the blind ones. The blind could now see because they believed in Jesus, and those who didn't believe were now blinded to the truth. I don't want you to be blinded to the, truth, to the truth. I know churches who are blinded to the truth. They say you have to work hard to get to heaven. You have to pray this way. You have to do this. You have to do that. And if you do those things, hopefully you'll get to heaven. Jesus has to be our top priority. We have to listen to him. We have to cling to him. See, I believe if we hold tightly to Jesus, we will love each other more than or the way we should love each other. We will love our neighbor. We will love our enemies. I believe if we hold tightly to Jesus, we will walk with a mix of humility and of power in the Holy Spirit. I believe if we hold tightly to Jesus, we will stay connected to him in prayer and worship. Because he literally is the foundation of our lives. The longer we hold to Jesus, the more we become like him. The more we're transformed into his likeness. Now understand me when I say we need to hold 
doctrine loosely, that doesn't mean that it's not important. It is important, but it's important that it's biblical, truthful, God-given, directive doctrine. Not rules and regulations, but I remember having conversations with my parents. And they would tell me the rules changed. I said, wait a minute, you aren't supposed to eat meat today? They said, oh, the rules changed. I said, what do you mean the rules changed? Yeah, because now we reach a certain age, we don't have to do it anymore. I said, oh, isn't that interesting? I said, I'm grateful that I'm part of a church whose doctrine stands on the word of God who never changes. I remember growing up, the rules were, you could do this before this, but you couldn't do it after this, and you could, oh, my word. And then it would change. I, said, I can't keep up. I can't keep up the rules changing. Loose doctrine is not good. Hold loosely to doctrine and cling tightly to Jesus. He is the author and he is the foundation of your faith, amen? And the disciples were learning. We can look at this and not feel bad about ourselves. Because disciples were in, the disciples were in agreement. Jesus, who sinned? This guy's blind. Who sinned? His parents or him? She said, boy, you guys are blind. I need to open up your eyes. None of them blind. That's not the purpose behind this. It was for the work of God and for God's glory. Now, we don't understand that. So, God, you made this guy blind so that one day you could reveal the Son of God to the world. Yeah. Wow. One day, Lazarus was going to be dead in a grave. We think, really? Did Lazarus really have to die? And God, Jesus came along and said, yeah, he did, because now I can reveal the glory of God to you. Watch what God can do. Things that happen in your life and my life, I can say, well, God, why did I have to have open heart surgery? Why did this? You know what? Only God knows. But God has a purpose and God has a reason for all of it. And we can say, well, God, was there an easier thing you could have done? What if I just stubbed my toe? Could you have used that? But God, these things happen in our life for God's glory to be revealed. And that's what Jesus said. No, nobody sinned. It was for the purpose of God's glory. Wow. But we don't see that and we don't understand that we are blinded by the truth unless we are clinging to Jesus. We will believe falsehood. We will believe lies. We believe what the devil says to us. God doesn't like you. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't love you. See what you're going through. And God comes along and says, devil, you need to shut up because this is for my glory. Watch what I can do. Watch what I can do with their mess. Watch what I can do with their hurts. Watch what I can do with their thoughts. Watch what I can do in their faith. Watch what I can do. The disciples were learning. The Pharisees, not. They had it backwards. See, the Pharisees held really tightly to doctrine and very loosely to Jesus. They didn't rejoice. They didn't rejoice when this man was healed. They didn't respond in wonder. They didn't respond in worship to Jesus. They didn't joyfully share the story with their friends and their family. They didn't even stop to think, hmm, maybe this Jesus guy is really who he says he is. Maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe he is the Son of God. No. Instead, they doubled down to their misguided doctrine, their selfish agenda, because religious people sometimes are infected with pride and cannot see when they might be wrong. That's the problem in our world today. Too many Christians hold on too tightly to doctrine and too loosely to Jesus. We put our beliefs about God ahead of walking with God. I said it before, it's easy. We can, we can have a relationship with the God of the Bible, but not the author of the Bible. We can have a relationship with the words and not with the one. I can tell you that that's so true. Go through and read scriptures. If you're not being convicted, something's wrong. 
Gandhi once said these words. He says, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. He said, they are so unlike Christ. See, when Gandhi looked at the lives of Christians, he said they were so unlike Jesus, they didn't walk with Jesus that made them look like Jesus or have an impact like Jesus. He said they hold highly on information and doctrine, but they show little self-giving love. What was Gandhi saying? He says Christians were holding tightly to doctrine and loosely to Jesus. Wow. Let's learn from the Pharisees. Let's hold tightly to Jesus and loosely on our doctrine, amen? Second thing I wanted to point out to you this morning is the fact God's love is restoring. I love that. God's love is restorative. There was a hard statement that Jesus made at the end of this passage. He said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Apostle Paul is a perfect example. Paul was great at knowledge. Paul was great at doctrine. Paul was a great, great at knowing what the Scripture said. He was a Pharisee, and he knew the law. He knew what it meant. He knew the Scriptures well. He was an expert in the law, but he didn't know God. He didn't know the God of the law. He didn't know the God of creation. And one day, he met the, li the living, risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And what happened to Paul? He literally became blind. Well, was Paul being punished? Was God pouring out his wrath on Paul? Not even close. God was just trying to get Paul's attention. And said, the God that you believe in, the God that you have all the laws... It's me. You need to have a relationship with me and not just a relationship with the doctrine. And what does God do? Paul is restored by God. Paul's a great illustration of God's nature of restoring. But sometimes the blind have to see, and sometimes those of us who see have to become blind. Paul's story is unusual. I mean, God doesn't literally make us all blind to come to faith in him. Sometimes he needs to just open our eyes up in ways we've never been opened before. And here we see him restore the sight of a blind man. And for the Pharisees, they were blind and didn't even know it. Jesus loved them too, though. And his purpose and his goal was to restore them because of his love. Some people receive grace like the blind men. Others receive justice like the Pharisees. But it's all in one purpose. It's all a two-sided coin. But both sides, the judgment and the love, is to get us to conform to be God and be part of God's image for God's rest restoration purposes. Listen, we're all on a journey of discovery, aren't we? We're all walking this journey of who God is and what God has done. I love the song that we sang about, you know, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. I know the first time I heard that song, I was crying like a baby, just having a tough time, a, a rough time in my ministry. And I heard that song, and I said, God, you know what? You have been faithful my whole life. You haven't turned your back on me. You haven't forsaken me. You're not punishing me. I'm just going through a rough time, but you know what? I am glad you reminded me that you have always been faithful. You've always been there for me. You get me through it all. You've gotten me through all kinds of garbage, all kinds of junk, all kinds of situations, all kinds of circumstances. You have been faithful and get me through it. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what you're going through today, but I can tell you tomorrow could be better because you serve a God who's faithful and his goodness is amazing. My question is to you this morning, are you holding tightly to your doctrine and loosely to Jesus? Because there was a time in my life I was. In fact, I was prideful to tell people I was obeying the, raw, the laws and the regulations of the church. Although my eyes were open, I needed to be blinded to the, because I was blinded to the truth.
One day Jesus opened up my eyes and I began to realize it wasn't just laws and rules and regulations Jesus wanted me to be part of. He wanted to have a personal relationship with me. That's what he wants to do in your life as well. I would encourage you, great way of start holding on to Jesus, is start reading the book of Matthew. Start reading chapters 5 and 6 and 7. And you will hear about the heartbeat of Jesus. You will hear about what he says, about what everybody else has been doing and what he wants to do. Jesus is giving us his teachings. And that's what Gandhi read when he became a follower of Jesus. We're all on a journey. We're all at different stages of sanctification. And this time of Lent is a time of letting go. This time of Lent is a time of self-evaluation. This time of Lent is getting in and looking at us and, and saying, am I doing things looking for accreditation or credit for what I've done, or am I just clinging on to Jesus? Don't get to heaven and pull out your notebook and saying, God, here's all of my credentials for getting into heaven. Here's all the works I've done. Here's all the good things I've done. Because he's going to say to you, those are nothing but filthy rags to me compared to my glory and my holiness and my righteousness. What he's going to be looking for when you stand at the gates of heaven, he's going to be looking for Jesus. He's going to be looking for how much of his son is in you. He's going to be looking to say, I don't care how much this you understood. This won't get you into the gates of heaven, but my son will. Hold on to the truth. Don't hold on to rules and regulations because it's my son who said these words. I am the way. I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the truth. No one, get, no one gets to the Father except through me. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't cling tightly to rules and regulations and loose doctrine that doesn't fall in alignment with Scripture. Cling to Jesus. If you haven't been clinging to him for a while, I pray today as we close up this service, you start clinging to him. I pray you'd run after him, you'd pursue him, and you'd hang on to him with all your might. You see what happens, we walk along with Jesus, and all of a sudden we find ourselves over here, and he's over there. See, we quit clinging. We started walking our own way, started doing our own things. The world caught our attention. Something caught our attention. And so instead of walking closer to Jesus, we started walking further away. And I pray today you'd wake up and open up and realize all the stuff that you went away from Jesus of that you thought were important. They're not important at all. We need to get back to clean with Jesus. Amen.